on. In this video, we are going to talk about fluid kinematics. Uh, that essentially means trying to describe the motion of the fluid as a function of time and space. We can choose several coordinate systems for analysis. We'll get to that in a bit. But what I want to first uh, draw your attention to is the fact that so far we have been looking at very uniform flows. We have been looking at uh, situations where we can use the Bernoulli equation, which means I look at variation of velocity along a streamline. I haven't really looked at, uh, let's say, velocity variation within the cross section of a tube um, or uh, cross essentially variation of the fluid velocity in um, space or time except along that streamline. So what we are going to do now is to try and derive a framework for analyzing fluid velocities and we'll come up with this concept of a velocity field uh, which lets us describe uh, the um, flow in a manner that we can extract useful quantities like forces or moments or pressures uh, from, from such a description. So uh, this part is going to be a bit math intensive, um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too challenging. So let's start with, um, well, first order of business is uh, revisiting mechanics. Anytime we talk mechanics, we are talking F equals MA. And F equals MA is always applied to a particular mass. So uh, a fluid is composed of many particles with mass. So if I have a fluid particle A, let's say that's um, at time T, it has a certain position given by that vector. And in a time delta T, it follows some path, let's say, and that same particle A is sitting at x plus delta x, t plus delta t. And so now I have an initial and a final position and presumably it got here through a process that involved acceleration in general, right? So um, I would like to find the acceleration of the particle so that I can calculate forces on it and things like that. Now, so that's one. So I have the fact that fluids, or rather fluid particles, have arbitrary trajectories. And two, usually this motion is due to some kind of force. So I have F equals MA. Uh, if I knew the uh, position of the particle at every point along this path, I could calculate velo uh, ca I could calculate velocities and I could calculate accelerations. So I could calculate forces acting on the particle at every instant of time between t and t plus delta t. Uh, so those forces that acted on it to produce that motion are likely to be the forces that we have already talked about, which are gravity, shear, some other body force that might exist, maybe electrical, magnetic. Um, so, uh, well, that's of course also pressure. So what we need to do is to come up with essentially F equals MA for a fluid, except that now, um, I want to do it in a way that I don't have to look at every particle. But, but let's revise once again. Um, so the velocity vector here might be pointing in this direction and the velocity vector at, at this instant, at this position is pointing in a different direction. So in general, if I said my velocity as a function of time and space, if I decomposed it into its three um, mutually perpendicular components, I would have u plus vj plus wk, where each of these is really a function of 
time and space. And if the velocity is a function of time and space, that really means that my acceleration is a function of time and space. And we would like to get an equation that tells me how these things can be calculated. But first, we need to choose a coordinate system. And a coordinate system for something like a fluid is not, um, you know, intuitive. If I took a ball, uh, you know, when we study solid mechanics or just rigid body dynamics, I throw a ball, it's acting um, under forces that are, well, it's, it's moving under forces that are acting on it. Those might be gravity, whatever uh, initial momentum was imparted to the uh, ball. So I, you know, if I if I fire a cannonball from a gun, I know that it's going to have a certain horizontal velocity. It's going to have a certain vertical velocity that's influenced by gravity. I can just write dv m dv dt. I can just write m dv dt equals a. And this a might be zero in the horizontal direction and equals minus g in the vertical direction. And I can just integrate this equation to get my velocity as a function of time. That's my solution. And this will give me my position as a function of time. Right? One can do that by just integrating. Not so easy for a fluid because there are millions of particles. I can either choose to look at every single particle, follow its motion in time and space and figure out what forces are acting on it. And as a result, when it encounters an, a solid object, for example, what force is it going to exert on that solid object, uh, things like that. And that's not, that's very hard. So what we would like to do is to come up with this well, we would like to use this field concept that we just derived here, uh, that we developed here, where we are essentially describing the velocity at a point. So I could say, well, I want to look at this position, x, y, z, at some instant t, and say that at this instant, at this location, this is the velocity I see. And an instant later, I'll again measure the velocity and find out what its value is but I might be looking at a different particle flowing through that location. So that brings us to the concept of an Eulerian versus a Lagrangian framework. Um, so an Eulerian, well, let me start with the Lagrangian because that's what we are more familiar with. So the Lagrangian system says, tag a particle, follow the motion of that particle to get the velocity Va as a function of time and Xa, Ya, Za as a function of time. Now, that particle will only have this particle A will trace out um, a path in space. So that means we get info on V and A. Um, let me continue over here at locations. that the particle passes through. So if I, if I release a, if I open a bottle of perfume at one end of the room, there are some molecules that travel in the direction of my nose. 
And so at some instant, I know that there is a certain concentration of perfume molecules ne near my nose. I don't know anything about what or how that perfume molecule has spread in other regions of the room unless I put a sensor at other locations of the room to find out whether there is a perfume molecule there. So I have to tag essentially all the molecules to find out what's going on in all the regions of space. So if I want for information at other locations, tag more particles. and repeat, right? So the Lagrangian system would say, okay, you take this particle, you draw a free body diagram for that particle. So now you know Fy, um, Fx acting on the particle, you can write summation F equals MA and so this gives you the acceleration if you know the force. From the acceleration uh, I know M dV dt equals A so I could say um, V at T plus delta T minus V at T equals A at T um, well, equals A at T times delta T over M, right? So this gives V at T plus delta T. And in turn, this V at t plus delta t can be approximated as x at t plus delta t minus x at t over delta t. And so this gives me x at t plus delta t. And I continue in this fashion for all particles. The other method is to use what's called the Eulerian framework. Here, my coordinate system is not fixed to the particle. It's fixed at a particular uh, point in space. So it's like saying, uh, well, if I want to find out what the speeds of a flock of geese are, I could either tag each individual goose and with a sensor just measure the velocities continuously of the goose at every point. And so I know as it's flying over a certain region how that velocity varied. Or I can just train my camera at a particular point and when the geese passes through the field of view I just measure that speed and that tells me what the speed of the geese is at that location. So uh, this uses the control volume concept, which means I essentially examine a small control volume that is fixed in space. And I look at inputs and outputs to that control volume. So in other words, I have this control volume. I know there's so much mass going in. I know there's so much mass and momentum going out. And there might be sources of mass or momentum. And there might be sinks of mass or momentum in the control volume. And so I basically write in minus out plus uh, source minus sink is rate of change. So that's my conservation equation. That's what we write
for the desired quantity which can be mass, momentum, energy and so on. So here our coordinate system is fixed. That means that I am only studying what's going on in that particular space. I don't know what happens to the fluid particle that leaves the control volume. I don't know how its velocity changes. But the Eulerian equation gives us what are called field equations. which are essentially partial differential equations. But if you were to solve these, these would give us the velocities as a function of time and space. So we first have to derive these well we still don't know how to do that so let's say these need to be derived. But the biggest sticking point in this is the fact that Newton's law really applies to a particular mass. So if I have a ball or if I use uh, the Lagrangian system where I follow one particular particle, I know what its mass is and I know that I can apply F equals ma to that particular mass. For the Eulerian system where I have a control volume, I look at it at time t and there's a particular set of molecules occupying that box. I look at it again at time t plus delta t and there's a different set of molecules that are occupying that box because some, some molecules went into the box and some went out. So I have overall a different set of molecules. The mass may have changed. So the question is, how do I go about writing F equals MA for a system that doesn't even have the same molecules? So that's, that's the big sticking point with using the Eulerian approach. So let's make that clear. over time delta t, different sets of molecules occupy the control volume. And so how do we apply F equals ma? What is the m here that we need to use. It turns out we can solve this problem uh, with what's called the Reynolds transport theorem and using this approach is nevertheless still more convenient than using the Lagrangian. There are particular cases where the Lagrangian approach makes sense but we'll mostly be sticking to the Eulerian approach in this course.